future of Alpha Cloud. Really, really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I'm curious. Yes, sure. Let's have it just throughout the whole uh, presentation. So whenever you have a question to any point, uh, just raise your hand, grab a, grab a mic, and shoot out uh, your question. Let's have a kind of discussion. I think discussion would be the best part of this presentation, actually. So yeah, dark matter is the future after, after the cloud. Um, yeah, so basically in this title, there are three topics which we will cover. The first is the cloud. And then we will touch upon this uh, dark matter project, and we will talk a little bit about the future. So, uh, well, what's about the cloud? Um, let's do just a quick facts check there, and uh, we'll see the emerging trends, which were already addressed by many speakers here before me. And uh, just a facts uh, fact check here: uh, a cloud has this nice feature which uh, gives an application or a solution kind of scalability where you can expand your solution uh, throughput and uh, processing without buying new hardware. This is how, why it's really so attractive to many businesses. This is why many businesses are closing their open data centers which were, they were running for years and moving their data to the cloud. And um, the second uh, feature is uh, reliability. It means it has, a cloud has kind of redundancy, your applications there. So if one instance uh, will fail um, while executing, probably the second uh, instance will support this first one, failed one, will take the task and still proceed in a, in a way that you will even not recognize what has just happened. You know? so, We'll move to the third one, and I think I should have put in this one in the first place. It's a kind of global access. When you have an application running as in cloud, you can access it. Well, maybe if you are not in China or in this kind of restricted countries, you can access uh, from all over the world your application. And this is uh, just another advantage of the cloud. And it's it's here since 2006. Um, it's uh, just a couple of years after it. It became kind of mainstream. Uh, the Amazon Web Services were the leaders and still are the leaders in this market. Um, yeah, as I mentioned here, uh, AWS is very big in the cloud and Microsoft is their Azure product. Google as well um, kind of maybe a little bit missed the market at the beginning, now trying to catch up. And IBM is definitely a big player. There are even um, more players, probably two dozens of them, which are really very visible on the market, uh, but I think this one is uh, the biggest one. <coughs> so what are the trends on this uh, market? Let's go on back. Cloud is here to stay. So even in initiating this dark matter project, uh, we are not replacing in any way uh, in the cloud. We are just complementing it and adding more features, which uh, just, just can cover much more use cases and uh, have completely different solutions as well. Uh, it's, I mean, at the beginning, maybe many were seeing cloud as a kind of solution for everything. But um, having experience with the cloud computing, I think now everybody, almost everybody, realized this is just a piece of a puzzle, of a bigger puzzle. And the bigger puzzle is definitely bigger than the cloud itself, the cloud business. Um, and we were talking today a lot about edge computing and the edge market is indeed not yet very big, but it will grow exponentially and I think it will definitely become bigger than the cloud itself. And um, yeah, we have seen this movement last year and in 2017 uh, Amazon get involved in the Free Artos open source project which is uh, a real-time operating system with a very small footprint. It means, and Amazon, I, I think they are very innovative in their kind of culture what they have. 
So once they def define or they, they identify a market um, hole or uh, demand, they are moving very quickly to close this demand and uh, provide some kind of solutions there. And uh, Microsoft with their Azure Sphere project, which was released just, uh, just last year, uh, they are pretty much targeting the same business. They are providing, they are very focused on the security aspects of the edge computing and they have a lot of experience there with their gaming industry kind of Xbox stuff when um, yeah, hackers were like hacking them uh, every now and then and they were always figuring out a solution where you can really have a closed system not to allow a community of hackers just to get involved and mess uh, with, the, with their hardware. Yeah, so what, what's all about the dark matter? We will just touch uh, on this point why, why this project has been initiated, what were the reasons. We will give a definition to it and we will see a kind of very rough uh, architecture how it works. Uh, yeah, and we will start with why. Well, because communication is um, expensive and slow kind of slow, not everywhere, it is very slow, but as was mentioned by many speakers here, uh, in the rural areas you will have definitely have problems with the uh, uh, um, speed of the internet there. And um, generally, I mean, communication is always a cost, costly factor there. And the latency is also part of the, of the speed. Uh, latency could become a problem. So it means you cannot have real-time uh, applications running uh, between your endpoint and the cloud and uh, back and forth. Maybe you can achieve this kind of uh, performance, but it will definitely cost you a lot of money and probably will be an overkill. And cloud storage might become uh, expensive as, it, that, as your data adds up. Uh, when we talk about big data or data lakes where you collect data without knowing what you are going to do with this data uh, just in advance maybe you will need you maybe you will need it but maybe not who knows it means you will need really a lot of uh, a lot of space so with the years i think uh, it can really grow very big and you you will have you will be paying every single month for your storage which is expanding like a unit, like the universe you know? Uh, storage, hard, uh, storage hardware is getting even cheaper and ever cheaper. It's uh, not only the storage itself, but also the performance of your edge um, hardware, which you can have uh, on your uh, premises, is also getting ever more performant and cheaper. And uh, the question is, will the factory run in case of internet outage? If you just start with a solution where you completely depend on the cloud. And uh, this is a big problem indeed, because if you go back to the, to the times when you didn't have internet in your factory, so if you don't have internet, your factory will still run, because, or I mean, if you just have some management level internet there, who are just uh, controlling the production process, how many units are being produced, if the internet is going down, well, the factory will continue to run, you, you will just have no information what's going on there but it's not so tragical. And in case if you connect, uh, connect completely to internet through, uh, to, to cloud through internet, you will be very much depending on it. And if you have no internet at some, at some times, you imagine your, your production process will stop and it will cause a lot of damage to your, um, to your operations. So well, uh, we we started this uh, dark matter project. It's it, it's a kind of open initiative to uh, to have. Uh, it's an attempt to create a framework where applications and services can be seamlessly deployed on different network levels, starting from your premises and up to the cloud, and be connected with each other. So in essence, in, you can see in the corners there. There is a set of um, Lego uh, bricks. It's a kind of set of Lego bricks which you have on your disposal where you can easily put them together because as we as we're also mentioned many times, every infrastructure, every industry looks pretty much different from one to another. 
So you will have to have a kind of degree of, conf of configuration in every, every single setup. And um, it's very different from your consumer electronics where you have a bunch of smartphones out there. You just develop one application and you just put it on the App Store and that's it. People will download it, maybe you will define what operating uh, system version it is, maybe just enable or disable dynamically some functions. This is a completely different story when we deal with the industry. Yeah, so this is like uh, the vision behind the dark matter project. And this is, we now go to the architecture where you have on top, you have the cloud. It, it could be also like, you, have, you would have different clouds. It's also would be possible, even from different vendors. And you will see here on the left and right, uh, these are kind of pictures for two different factories. And uh, they would have, an, uh, each one would have a gateway. And this gateway could be, uh, an, a, I, it's called sometimes a fork device, which uh, has some capacity to perform computations and maybe some storage attached. So it will, it, it will be capable to run different applications. Uh, and as you see here in the um, green boxes are applications and the orange boxes are services. And they could run on a, on a gateway level, but also on the edge uh, level, which are edge devices you, you see below, below the gateway. And to the edge devices there are these uh, round points are sensors and actuators which are connected to, to your edge devices. Well, you, from this picture you will see like you would run pretty much the same applications and services on, on just different levels. And you would deploy them uh, as you wish. I mean, as you, as you need in your production process. And you can also add some redundancy. You see the links there. These dashed links uh, are the connections between devices. And if one connection fails, the system should be designed in a, in this, in a way that it will kind of compensate for this, fa for, for this failure of one single device. It can also kind of rebuild itself uh, in a different way. So it, in a way, it's a kind of mesh-like system. And uh, you see the link also between the gateways. It means actually that you can have a kind of independence and interconnectivity inter between your factories, even in a case when the cloud will fail. And if you have this kind of link, maybe you will, uh, maybe you will transfer or exchange some data between your factories, even without touching the cloud. So as you see, Having this kind of framework gives you a lot of freedom where you can plan your own architecture in a way which <coughs> makes sense for you and for your processes. Are there any questions like to the uh, general architecture of the framework? Do we have a mic? I mean, in this picture, it's uh, obviously quite uh, private. Yeah, but I mean, uh, in some cases, in some companies, they are actually private cloud into their premises. Well, the question is still, you know, where your data is being stored. And the bigger companies, they have uh, the more complicated security regulations, which means, uh, like, if it's a business data, if it's a, a data about their uh, people who are involved in the production, they, are, they have to have a very high degree of security. It means they also require sometimes to run it on their own hardware. So it's, I know it's a kind of course, sometimes it's a problem to make all these security clearances and clarifications whether, whether it's allowed to be stored there and so on. Because at the end of the day, still, you are running on the uh, machines of, of uh, some company. Uh, some like third-party company like Amazon, for example, it's not your machine. You still have very high degree of control because of this old security 
uh, certificates uh, and uh, rules which you can set up and which are completely in your hands to define the rules, who would have access to the data, and so on. But there are still concerns. So my question is, uh, can I build your framework in my own file cloud? Is it possible to do this? Yeah. I mean, we don't have a, a product in place right now. This framework is just uh, in the ideation phase, and we are still thinking how to design it. And I, there are already some kind of technical uh, decisions uh, uh, we were made. What we will use, we will use, for example, containers to deploy this kind of applications and services. But I will uh, describe it a little bit uh, more on the next slide. And uh, yeah, you can take it and put on your either on your own edge device, on your own phone device, or in your own cloud, or in somebody's cloud. Thank you. Okay. And there was another question there. As a picture of the legal box, and uh, this picture suggests you can one think of it's like an advanced microservice architecture with, with, with cloud and edge redundancies. Yeah, this is like microservice services are being used very intensively in the cloud kind of environment, but it's not only the solution for the cloud because it's just uh, splitting one monolith into smaller parts which are scalable, which are rep 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 replicable, and uh, it fits very much to, to our paradigm as well. Okay, there was another question there. Yeah, we are considering also to use Kubernetes within our framework and maybe we will have, because Kubernetes not, maybe doesn't go so far to define everything, you know, the whole ecosystem and we want to go further and define uh, interfaces between uh, services and we, we would also go and touch upon uh, interfaces between modules and for example we would use REST APIs and uh, uh, um, graph query language to exchange data between instances. And it's a kind of more generalization of the, of the things. And uh, you could use Kubernetes and uh, containers, but you could use probably also different other technologies uh, to kind of target this, uh, this, use, uh, this to implement this framework. Any other questions at this at this point? Then we will proceed further. Um, well, this are uh, let's let's go through the properties or mm, of, of this framework. It should be flexible. It means you could easily you could easily customize it to set it um, up in your own way, and it shouldn't be really very very difficult that you would need uh, like a bunch of professionals. And once you hire them, they will set it up for you, and then they will leave, and you will be left with this architecture. Once you bring some new devices, you extend your production line with a new line, you will again hire, need to hire somebody to go and redesign the whole thing. This is what we want to avoid. This is more like you add new stuff, and it will be recognized through the logic which is built in, in into this framework. And uh, this is it should be kind of very easily scalable. It's a mesh like as I already mentioned it, so it means uh, you could have potentially scenarios where you have completely decentralized system, where you have a lot of independence or you have a lot of control over your hardware and over your processes. So yes, as I already mentioned as well, um, we will use containers in the first place for deployment of applications and services because um, partially because containers are really very popular right now there is a big uh, community of developers behind this technology and it fits very much to, uh, to our concept as well and uh, the communication between needs uh, is planned to be through REST APIs and also uh, graph query language which is kind of very similar, but uh, solves the problem uh, slightly different 
The technology comes uh, from GraphQL, comes from uh, originally from Facebook, but it's an uh, open project which is being developed by the whole world and a lot of people are involved there as well. Yeah, and let's talk about future, uh, future and we will have kind of <laughs> try to predict what comes in the future. And um, I want to concentrate on two aspects. One is the technology and another one is the society. And when it comes to the technology, future of the technology, I think uh, whatever you do, it should be highly intuitive. Whatever your technology you're kind of trying to build uh, to address mass customer adoption, adoption or like uh, if you want to roll it out uh, on a very big scale, you have to really very seriously consider intuitiveness because uh, people nowadays don't have much time to learn your stuff. If it's completely different from the rest of the world, what the rest of the world is doing, if you used to build system in this way where you build some box, you know, with not much design, not much intuitability, and you give it in the, in the hands of the customers and you just supply a Bible as an instruction to go through every single function to learn about stuff, it, it will not be adopted in a, on a big scale. So it means Whenever you design your products or services, you have to consider this aspect from the very beginning. And it's very, very important. That's why I have just put it there in the first place. Well, the future, in the future, will, the customers will demand, demand everything faster. They will have everything working faster than before. And um, just generally, like, you know, predicting the future is, I think many people think it's very difficult how to predict which technology will come up, what exactly people will demand, where is the market, where, how should I move to address or be the first on the market. And if you think deeper about this kind of stuff, there are things which are always changing, especially in the technological field. But there are also some trends which more or less stay the same all the time. Like, Let's, let's take this example, for example, if you have a book about programming language, which is maybe 10 or 15 years old, probably, or most certainly, it will be outdated in a decade. If you have a book about love, probably it will not. It will still be up to date, because it's about something that is really very deep, built into, into people and into the society. So, what I want to address here, um, let's focus on the trends which are there right now, they were there before and they will be there in the future. So the speed is really very, very important aspect in this, uh, in this manner. And it should be cheaper, <laughs> I mean, not always. Uh, there are many uh, exclusions from this rule, but think about it. When you, by writing something cheaper sometimes, if all the other aspects are similar to your competition, you will have um, you will have a slight edge while while doing so, and you will have a chance to address uh, customers on a bigger scale by lowering your ma margin. But still, uh, on the end of the day, you will have even more money, like uh, from uh, from selling this product because it has such a mass mass adoption. So. Don't really afraid to be, be cheaper, but it's very applicable. Like com could be completely different depending on your field, and uh, it applies very much to consumer electronics. Not so much maybe to the industry, but still secure. I mean, who want less security than before? Okay, we want always more security. So, and independence. I think it's also very important what is being very frequently ignored. That the customers, like every company tries to bid the customer to themselves, to be like dependent on them, on their technology. But if you look deeper into their heads, what they actually, how they feel, I think many of them want to be diverse and independent. The future of work, and this is even more important, we don't have much time, we'll, we'll go through through this. 
Um, this is uh, my pain point, uh, pain point and a big pain point for many of my colleagues who are kind of of my generation or maybe even younger. Um, so whatever you do in the company, you should really concentrate uh, in your employees um, on this customer experience. It should be really the thing. Uh, and you should also unchain the innovation within. It means every organization has a huge potential of innovation. And if you just go out of the way of the people, it will just flourish. Don't, I, I think still nowadays many don't, just don't understand it, don't get it. Empower the people and make them happy. Like, we have this buzzword like ownership culture, you know. Unfortunately, in most of the cases, it's still a buzzword. It's not really getting to the people. Once you feel yourself an owner of a company or, or co-owner of the company, you treat the products, the customers and your colleagues completely differently. And if you want to change something, you should be able to do this. Ideas over here, uh, hierarchy or creativity with, uh, against uh, authority. I think this is also a very important aspect because, because you know, the great ideas are somewhere there within your company, maybe also outside your company. Just uh, let them go, let them be heard, and. Uh, yeah, one, one point here, I think that everyone is a leader. And whenever I hear in companies like our leadership team decides to do this and that, I kind of uh, feel sad a little bit because I think everyone uh, it could be or should be a leader and it seems what he does in his, in his job. And just to say somebody is a leader or some bunch of people are leaders, in many cases they are not actually. And it makes all other people are followers. And uh, I don't know, I don't think so. But how, how should you implement it? And my answer is create, this is from revolution, but it doesn't really matter, create 10 commandments. Like if you want to implement this in your organization, Either create this 10 rules, really very concrete rules, not very abstract. Or put your people together to decide which rules you would have. This would define the culture within an organization and it will uh, allow innovation to go and flourish. Do we have time? For yes, yes, you okay. have one minute. One minute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's go really very fast. Uh, so I, I just yesterday evening while I doing these slides, I just came up with this idea of three steps to innovation. And the first one would be identify a problem. So once you see a problem, just write it down. The second one, suggest at least one solution. It would be better if you have several ideas of solutions, how to solve a problem. It could be also not a problem, but just an opportunity which you discovered in your daily work. And the third one uh, is to act. And this one is very important. So once you identify a problem, we see a lot of people there who are like, yeah, this doesn't work, this sucks, and everything. So if you stop there, you're a complainer. And this is not OK. You have to make the next step. And if you, <laughs> if you make the next step, you will give a suggestion, you know, is this, I could do this better, or this, it should better or work better with this technology or whatever. You are just as smart as. Because you are always like kind of generating here or you think you know better. But the this, this third step is really very essential and I'm closing my presentation with this one. If you do the third step, then you are the main innovator. I think that's it. This is like where you can get more information about the framework. You can change the, join the framework. It's an open project. And yeah. I don't, think, I don't think we have any Thank you for all these yes. good visions. What comes after the cloud? You gave us the answers. <laughs> so, do you have questions that you would like to ask? Now is the last chance. You know that? Yeah. No questions? Good. 
So thank you so much also to you, Karen Tarasian from Freeware Lovers, for you also as North President from this region. And thank you for coming.